Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Media Renaissance Show. Today we have Michael Heron, who's worked across the UK and Iberia in finance, media, and business development. In our conversation, we meander across several topics, starting with Lisbon's entrepreneurial evolution, digital nomads, concerns about over-tourism, tips and stories about raising trilingual children, how the English Renaissance emphasized written and performative works over visual arts, William Shakespeare, William the Conqueror, multi-layered abridged artwork, and how media recommendations feel different when it comes from a person versus an algorithm, especially as it applies to DJing. Learn the language of curation yourself is the title of this episode, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello, welcome to the Media Renaissance Show. This is Michael Fiorentino, and I'm here with special guest Michael Heron. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. How are you doing? Very well. Thanks for coming. I know we've known each other for a long time here in Lisbon, and you've followed me along the journey, and I've seen your business progress too. And we tend to have long phone conversations sometimes. Yeah, yeah, we do. I think because we're like demographically similar, foreigners in Lisbon, and uh, let's just say we like to go out to fun social events sometimes. You do some DJ, and we could talk about that in a bit. We can. Normally in the Media Renaissance show, we do a little bit of the past, present, future, talk about where we see things going. You're British of origin, and we'll talk about that. Uh, So we might talk about what was happening in the UK during the Renaissance. Was it even called the UK during the Renaissance? Why don't we start first with just talking about how do we know each other? Where did we meet? Yeah, so we met in this very building in 2017, I believe, November 2017. So Startup Lisboa was doing something called uh, Launch in Lisbon. I think it was the first year of their program. So the idea was it was for foreigners that either had an existing business or wanting to start a business that were thinking about moving to Portugal. And so there was a great group of us. And um, I remember when we, when we all signed up to the program, we were all sent uh, the names of everyone that would be, be on the program. So I took the time to read everyone, did a bit of stalking, a bit of uh, you know, research. And I saw this guy, Michael Fiorentino, who's this guy? He seems really interesting. So I'm going to make an effort to sit next to him and talk to him. Who's this Guido? <laughs> <laughs> it was not the first session of Launch in Lisbon. It was like session zero. It was almost yeah. this prototype. I remember, so I had first come down to Lisbon in May of 2017 as a stopover on the way to somewhere else to kind of check out some startup scene uh, locations, see what the communities were about. Lisbon was kind of like a chill afterthought, like, oh, why don't I come here and meet these people? And I ended up having a great conversation with the community manager. And, you know, we we kept in touch in emails and they said, hey, there's this launch in Lisbon program. It's going to tell you how to move to Europe. If there's any sort of like loans or grants, how do you deal with taxes? How do you deal with hiring? Meet some people. And I thought that's kind of cool. But like, I don't know if I want to, you know, invest my money in doing that right now because I don't know if I want to go to Lisbon per se versus anywhere else. And what ended up happening was it ended up getting sponsored. And they said, hey, we're actually offering free tickets if you come here. It was right before Web Summit. I thought, I need to go. I yeah. just need to get in a plane. I need to get there. Just figure it out. Whatever is useful here will be useful anywhere else I want to move to in terms of considerations. So we did that, um, came here, and it was really fun. They, they gave us pastel de nata in the mornings, um, a lot of intense sessions. And we did like scavenger hunts in the afternoon. And yeah. Oh, that's right. We didn't pay for it. It was free. <laughs> and we were going to pay for it. I remember the organizers were like, well, the fact that you guys were going to pay for it means that you were the right people to do it. And then we ended up doing it for free. So that was, that was definitely an added bonus. It was great. And now they do charge for it. But actually, yeah. they, they do a lot in their programming. It does take some resources to put you in a bus and ship you around places yeah, and schedule meetings and, you know, the hosts. Uh, I think you actually ended up hosting one morning when the, the person who was yeah. running it was uh, not I, feeling I, so well. I did, a, I did a session on cultural integration into Portugal, which was probably not the most diplomatically correct or politically correct training session, but it was super interesting. It was you super you gave interesting. it a very long disclaimer, so we'll yes. give you that. Yes. But I, I wanted to point out one thing I asked you years later. I think we were at a Benfica uh, football game. Yeah. And, um, we well done for saying football, not soccer, by the way. Congratulations. I Thank you. It took me a while. <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not really a big sports <laughs> follower anyway, so to change one word is okay. <laughs> but yeah, you have some of these like box seat VIP client yes. seats. Yes, um, yes. Which I'm not a big sports game goer to, yes. but if you take me to some place with really good food and drinks and, a, and an eagle that flies around the stadium, yeah. I will go there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember I asked you after knowing you for a while, I said, you know that time that you took over that morning session and talked about the culture? I said, were you secretly planning to do that all along? I said, I, I'm not going to respect you less if you do that. But yeah. I was like, that was a pretty baller move to just go there and just, you know, 
come in and talk about, oh, and by the way, I, I do somewhat services that are similar to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was asked to do it. So I was asked to do it. So the, um, the Texan girl, American girl that was hosting the event, so she needed someone to do a session because they either had someone let them down or something. And I think she kind of like jokingly asked me and I said, well, actually, yeah. And, you know, because my consultancy business, I do sometimes do kind of like culture in integration or training sessions for expats or like foreigners that come to Lisbon and are a bit unfamiliar with the, the business landscape and the culture and need a bit of help. So that's kind of where that fell into. So it was, well, it was a convenient plug. A convenient plug. But like, why did you come to this session if you already knew all this stuff? Um, at the time, I was reluctant whether it was the right fit for me. All the other people in the program hadn't necessarily decided to live in Lisbon yet whereas I'd already been living in Lisbon at that time for three and a half years and I'd already set up my business but my business was very young at the time I'd only been founded about five or six months before and I didn't think about it properly at the time but now I realize why it was so valuable for me it was the first time that I'd seen the importance of networking with co-founders of other businesses or that we're going to have the idea to have another business and in that week I learned more about the world of startups and entrepreneurialism than I had done, you know, ever before in my entire life. So that was a real like moment for me to see that, yeah, actually, if you're in an environment with people who are driven, who have this, you know, way of seeing the world where they want more, they want to create something, um, just by being with people like that, just for a week, you come away from it feeling energized, stimulated. But I still learn a lot of things as well. Yeah, well, it's, it's so nice to have a warm introduction to a city. Yeah, I remember for me when I came, it was like we got to meet some people that run incubators. Uh, Village Underground, you know, got one of those hipster yeah. like um, yeah. buses in the yeah. sky and yeah. had a meal. Right. And yeah. We were yeah. in these sprinter yeah. vans going around the city, and it was kind of great. People were from everywhere. Um, some of them, I think, most of them actually did end up moving here with varying degrees of success. Yes, it, it was just such a good introduction. And then by the end of that and Web Summit, and there was these Web Summit parties in the Hub Creativo Beato. It's this old military bread factory yep. for when they were having these colonial wars and they just kept it empty for 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah, yeah. And they said, we're going to turn this into a startup mecca, I guess, kind of like Station F in Paris, the hub Creativo Beato. We're going to focus on creativity and arts and parties because yeah. that yeah. area was a lot of abandoned warehouses. I say was because the whole area has turned into very glamorous, expensive expat housing. I remember being there and there was these parties and these empty buildings with people hanging outside the doors and like art installations. And then all of a sudden I was just there in a crowd. And I said, you know what? I'm moving here. I said, Fuck yeah. it, I'm moving here. Yeah. Mate, it was one of the cheapest parts of Lisbon to like rent or buy property at the time. It was just all derelict. And then obviously it's transformed. I ended up looking at apartments and I found one in Marbella, which is by Beato. And I thought, oh, this is going to be so close to the Hub Creativo. This is 2018. I'm like, it's going to open in like a year and a half. It's 2023. That place is still not really open. Part of it is they have the yeah. Fabrica to startups. Is that, is that the pandemic that's caused that process to, to slow down a bit? Or? I'm sure that was a convenient excuse. Okay. But I think even when I told people, oh, I'm going to move here and I'm going to be able to ride my bike or walk past there to go to this place and I can go to my office there because I'm creative and my company is going to be so successful. A lot of the people look at me like, uh-huh, yeah, you think you're going to move there in two years? It's not mm. been that but now they're starting to open them up piece by piece or like a restaurant yeah so it's like half construction half filled out yeah so that's the joke that i'm gonna have an office there one day that it's gonna be ready and that it's gonna <laughs> be possible and and i do i still live in that same apartment i'm going up five years you know. But you know in a way that sums up perfectly the startup scene in portugal because i think it's still massively in transition so even for me i remember back in the day like 2017 when we met when we met and i had no idea that this this startup world was like existing and growing it still feels that way now but i still feel that there's still a lot more that needs to be done it needs more visibility and i don't know if that's because in portugal especially historically companies have been given funding or credit it's a very conservative model so normally like the banks will only give money to a company that is already successful to help them grow and scale up they won't give money to startups so it's very very difficult so obviously you have to find funds from other countries to get funding there's definitely less zeros when you're raising money or asking for money in portugal if yeah. you're asking from local sources portugal is a country that very much looks outward toward the world and they do invite people to come here uh, they often win best hosts for people from foreign countries uh, we could talk about how that's changing now, yeah. but um, I think if you come here with the right mentality and you want to contribute to the ecosystem, it's very easy to meet and connect to it quickly uh, and sort of find out if you're going to succeed or crash and burn 
Yeah. Or be like me and just keep going forever, no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> um, they like a mixture of ideas. It is mm. a crossroads. It's been a crossroads for a long time. I, I think that digital nomads kind of changed the personality a little bit, especially after COVID. Coming here, realizing they could work remotely, but they could live here and they could work here and have their life here for months at a time or if they get the right visas for years at a mm. time. I think here it's really comes down to community. And that's one thing where you realize you want to know yeah. people. And there is a mixture of locals that are always here, expats that are here for the long term or retiring here and a lot of these people that are here for vacation or they pretend like yeah. they're working but they're really on a long vacation yes so let me ask you a question do you think that post covid the world has changed in that sense so that digital nomads are coming to portugal not because they want to be part of a startup scene where they can meet other people and innovate together it's just i want to come here because the weather's good it's cheap i can have a chilled life and live in this bubble and they don't really interact with each other. Or and avoid politics from their home country. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think there's a lot of people who come here for that. Yeah. And Web Summit brings in new people every year. Yes. You know, and, and so people that have never been to Lisbon come here and they see it as a tech place. And that was an investment from the city. It's, it's expensive. They paid the Web Summit organization to stay here and not to move to other cities that were competing to they say got this. A 10 year deal, I think. It was a 10 year deal to stay here for 10 years. Yeah, 10 year deal. Yeah. I think a lot of the younger population can, instead of leaving the country, which happened during recession years, they can stay here and work internationally. So it's a mixture of all of that. Okay. Do I think that's good or bad? In any major city, if you're meeting people, you kind of eye someone up and down and you say, are you actually here for real? Or are you just following the Instagram pics? That's a real yeah, thing. Yeah. There's the phrase over tourism. Yeah. That's a common thing. Yeah, yeah. And you know, we had a period where Lisbon's been growing since I would say about 2012 to 2019 2020 yeah because it coincides with the golden visa program starting in 2011 and then obviously suddenly lisbon just being this location that everyone wanted to visit and go on holiday and like winning all these awards best city in the world to visit in three days and all this kind of stuff um you've seen tourism and just this growth not just in lisbon but in porto as well and now in other parts of the country and that happened so quickly i mean i saw it i got here may 2014 and I was still an anomaly then, you know, a British guy in, in Lisbon was unusual. Now, pff, I, I mean, wish I got here in, in May of 2014 or actually in like... You still got here early enough though. You did well. You did well. You got here early enough. And I stayed. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. That helped. Exactly. Um, so let, let's talk about you being British and your accent. Yes, Because <laughs> sure. we can already hear that. Sure. You're from the UK, but you're also Argentinian yes. and Spanish. Yeah, Break so that the, down for us. Yeah, so, well, it's, it's a strange one. So basically, my, um, my mother's side of the family are from, are from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. And um, she, with my grandparents and her sisters, relocated to Madrid in 71. So leaving a dictatorship in Argentina to arrive in a dictatorship in Spain under Franco. And so my mother had this really interesting late teenage years as a student um, studying in Spain where... You know, students were starting to protest against the regime, but couldn't do it that openly. So it was kind of quite a, a dangerous time. It wasn't like you'd imagine the 70s to have been like in the US or the UK, where it's, you know, free love, it's all smoke pot and, um, you know, listen to Pink Floyd and figure out what the, what the music means. My mother's experience wasn't like that, but she kind of saw kind of like the back end of that. And then she met my father in Scotland and I grew up in the UK. So Norwich, so it's a city in, the, in East Anglia, it's uh, in Norfolk, it's about an hour and a half, two hours from London, very close to Cambridge, uh, beautiful countryside, very, very chilled, um, very um, isolated in a way to the rest of the country. Now, are there any TV shows or movies that I could see something from around that area and be like, oh, that's what it's like? And in terms of cultural references, I mean, we have Alan Partridge that was a, a fictional character who ran a... Uh, a radio station in Norwich. It didn't necessarily portray people from Norwich in a particularly positive light. Norwich is a beautiful city. It's, we've got two cathedrals, so a Roman Catholic and a, and a Church of England cathedral, and a castle which was home to William the Conqueror. So it was actually okay. a very important city in Europe in like the 11th century. But I know this isn't Renaissance related, and we will get to some aspects of the Renaissance at some point. Sure. What did William the Conqueror do? So basically, he invaded uh, England back in the Battle of Hastings in 1066, and effectively he conquered uh, England. So the French effectively took over. He was ruler um, before the, um, the, the now current British uh, royal family um, came back into power. But effectively, he was um, in charge. He was in charge. And um, his main residence was Norwich Castle. Okay. Uh, and it's a beautiful castle. Yeah, so uh, Norwich was definitely... People may not know much about it now, but back in the day, it was one of the most important uh, cities in, in Europe for, for that reason. 
Um, one thing I think was unique to your position is, let's see, shortly after we met, I went to your kid's birthday party. Yeah, yeah. And when you sang Happy Birthday, you sang it in Portuguese, Spanish, and English. Yes. It's a different song in Portuguese, right? It is. And he's in it, it's the same tune, but and then the, the, the Spanish version that was sung because my, because my ex is Venezuelan, it was sung in the Venezuelan version of Happy Birthday, which is very different. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was a real hot pot of... Uh, of, of culture for sure and it goes faster because you start clapping and it, it kind of yeah. like it, it's a little stressful and i'm like wait i'm just barely tracking what these words are yeah, yeah. what's happening and, it, and i'm like your kids because now you, you have two kids yeah uh what languages are they speaking now yeah so they i mean the spanish and portuguese is literally like 100 percent bilingual the english is taking them a little bit longer because it wasn't the dominant language when they were growing up but now they're with me half the time their english is really starting to to improve a lot they understand everything in english struggling a little bit to speak it but it's just because having grown up spanish portuguese and english what sometimes happens with trilingual children is that two of the languages will happen like a lot quicker and then, then the third one can kind of lag behind but i've spoken to a lot of my family about this who have raised children in a similar situation and they always say to me just don't worry just stick at it like the english will get there eventually and it will be good well also anyone living in portugal the the kids the students now they speak great english usually because yeah. they have a connection to the media yeah but even if they speak just as well as any portuguese person it's going to be amazing yeah i've heard some strategies where one parent has to speak one language the other yeah. parent has to speak the other language you yeah. can't cross pollinate yeah is that what you do yeah yeah although it's difficult sometimes to remember that because often i will forget what language i'm speaking in it's really weird and sometimes i'll even talk to them in portuguese and they find it really funny when i talk to them in portuguese because <laughs> they don't associate with me with, with speaking portuguese well, but when i just speak to them in english they won't always reply in english but they understand everything and they'll kind of reply with a mixture of spanish and so what you got to do is make them watch their favorite tv shows or disney movies in english absolutely that really helps and reading as well i read a lot to them at night and that that massively helps too reading and watching an original version which it's probably one of the reasons why Portugal has such a high level of English because back in the day before Netflix, nothing was dubbed. So everything was with subtitles. So I think that's why that generation of Portuguese have such a good level of, of English. Yeah, there was right? a moment where everyone went from learning French to learning English. It just became the more yeah. de facto standard. Yeah. And yeah. I could see why, although there's an argument for both. I think. I mean, French is a dying language. Let's not, let's not, let's not kid ourselves, right? <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, there's a lot of the world that still speaks French and they actually try to maintain it. Portuguese as a language and French are still... This is also, I, go in, but don't do everything because I made the mistake of jumping on everything and that's where I had to... Well, when they had the mazes, the kids could just zip yeah, around yeah, and, you know, yeah. we're like mice in a way. We could, yeah. like, when you're smaller, you could just go through everything and your whole body's just cartilage. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think part of me wants to go to one of those trampoline parks. Mate, I was having a great time and I did a bit of trampoline when I was younger, so I knew, like, how to jump in the middle of the trampoline. I was going really high up and these little kids looking up going, oh, he's getting high, he's getting high. Yeah, because you, you kind of do like the yeah, momentum yeah exactly yeah. exactly and then i tried to land on my bum to bounce back up and when a child tells you do it again as a parent that's when you know don't do it again because you're gonna get in trouble <laughs> and that's how it went psh, and i heard the crack it went crack wow so yeah yeah it was nasty it was nasty but thankfully it wasn't serious and i'm good now on the on the road to recovery and just can't wait to take this thing i off. mean if you still have it in you know late september you can go to oktoberfest with that true 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 no i think within a month this thing will be off so in time for the summer it'll be perfect so let's go back to that time you talked about. You mentioned that you tend to know all the lawyers in town. Yeah. Uh, and in my experience, if I ever need to find an accountant, lawyer, consultant, you're yeah. the person I go to. I'm like, hey, yeah. I'm kind of like looking for someone who does this, this, and this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to work for a law firm called Miranda Asociados for three years. I was sort of head of their business development. I did that for, for a while and then set up my business Avonlight, which is effectively providing consultancy for law firms, not just in Portugal, but initially it was just in Portugal. Uh, and I'm also now the interim editor of Iberian Lawyer and Latin American Lawyer magazine, which are publications specifically for the legal sector. So I edit the magazine. Wow. Yeah, and we do podcasts and obviously I write content as well. So basically I spend probably 90% of my professional time engaging with corporate lawyers in one, one fashion or another. Once you know the lawyers, you end up knowing everyone else because obviously in the corporate world, whether it's banking, private equity, real estate, startups, startups, <laughs> exactly. Then everyone needs a lawyer at some point, right? And also, you know, someone has to keep an eye on them and make sure that they're behaving all the time as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, how is that culture different with well, American lawyer culture? There's maybe a bit of a reputation of like the ambulance chasers, you know, like yeah. everyone's suing everyone in the US. Yeah. And in Europe, it's different. 
Yeah, it's not as litigious as the US for sure. It's the rules on what you can and can't do in terms of marketing are a lot stricter uh, in Europe, especially in Portugal compared to the US, which is why, you know, in the US you will see like, you know, the Better Call Saul parody is the perfect one. It's so, <laughs> it's so well done. That's literally what it's like in the US for that kind of lawyer, not corporate law firms. The lawyers that I know, the law firms that I work with, they have a much more conservative approach to marketing and communication. And is that a cultural difference? Not necessarily. I mean, I would say it's more a European thing. Um, but I would say generally in the US, lawyers can be far more aggressive with how they sell and, and the work that they need to generate. So it's kind of just a bit different. I think it is changing. The culture here in Portugal with sales as well, it's very, very different. Um, I don't mean this in a bad way, but most Portuguese companies are shit at selling. Their business development and sales teams are really bad. I get approached a lot and it would be these awful messages on LinkedIn which aren't tailored, they haven't got a clue who I am or what I do. I've just been added to this database or they're sending me, you know, this this crap. And um, it's because there's a fear of selling, but also just, I think it's a relatively new concept. Well, wait till the AI takes over that. Well, exactly. But the thing about AI, I think, is that that's one of the areas where I think AI will not be able to do the same job because when you're selling to someone, especially if it's business to business, that personal element is so important that human to human building a relationship where you have to sometimes think on your feet i know ai is incredibly sophisticated and it's becoming even more sophisticated in that sense but i think that'll be one of the few exceptions where i don't think a machine can replace that communication part of being able to convince someone to buy something from you we're going to have a very subtle cue of knowing when it's fake and real and the problem is when you don't and that's probably why we need regulations and laws and indications that there is some sort of technology that's targeting you that maybe it doesn't have a person behind it yes um, i think we're going to move into that phase we already are there because we have targeted ads everywhere yes. we go yes but there's something about a genuine connection that is really hard to replicate. especially b2b sales is different right but my best approach to selling is cold calling calling people speaking to them on the phone uh, it just works god i'm right awful there. at that <laughs> <laughs> it's it's horrible but then it's a great skill once you once you're good at it it can help you in so many facets especially growing a business right because even if, even if your business is b2c you're still going to have to know how to call people whether it's an investor whether it's a prospective client whatever so it's a really important skill to have and um, often my approach is i will call someone and say look i'm going to be completely honest with you this is a cold call but if you give me 30 seconds i promise we can end the conversation if what i have to say isn't of interest within 30 seconds how does that sound does that sound fair yes okay and then bang i've got them right i'm upfront about the fact this is a cold call from the first second you'll be like okay at least he's being honest with me Fine. you're also efficient seconds. with time that's good yeah 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 and you're asking for permission as well where does the name avonlight come from yeah so basically it comes from the portuguese word avançar meaning to move forward so this idea that Law firms, but you know, corporate clients we work with in general, need to be continually moving forward. And light just simply means we can bring light to your business. And sometimes you need that outside input to uh, take you to a different kind of success. And our yeah. slogan is a different kind of like success. Like a glow or a spotlight. Exactly. Exactly. So Ava yeah. Light, okay. That's the name of your company. And then when you were in front of the Launch and Lisbon group and you were presenting, you talked about how we should look at our advancement of ourselves as we across these cultures and communities yeah so basically i think there's a very simple equation which is your skill times your contacts equals your value and what i mean by that is that your skill set will be something that you develop over time but eventually will plateau whereas your contacts are something that will be exponentially something you can grow forever and that's the part of the equation you can always work on to increase your value yeah so it's so important to get into different cultures and communities and to cross pollinate yeah like a simple explanation is if you can learn another language, you've automatically got access to more people. Therefore, you'll make more contacts and more meaningful connections. So learning languages is a really easy way to do that. At one point in the Launch of Lisbon program, we were looking at these beautiful spaces. I think we saw Farfetch, which was yeah. this super modern Incredible. building, beautiful rooftop deck overlooking the river. They had ball pits. And I was like, this might be the nicest building I've ever seen. I mean, New York City has nice buildings, but we also are confined in space. Yes. But then you were telling me about the Bloomberg building because you'd worked there. Yes. And to be fair, the Bloomberg building I was in is nothing compared to the Bloomberg building now. So the Bloomberg building now is one of the most incredible examples of modern architecture that you will see in the world right now. What were you doing at Bloomberg? And this is Bloomberg UK, London? Yeah, yeah. So I was in sales. Um, in fact, my main client at the time was Lehman Brothers before they went bankrupt. 
but the year 2008 when they were my client i was the main account manager through the bloomberg terminal so it was a great time to be in finance unfortunately then the credit crisis happened lehman brothers before that bear stearns aeon so that all kind of like went to shit. it was a really important lesson to look to remember and yeah the office was banging i mean it was like uh you know, free food and drink all day. Did they allow soda in there? Because, you know, Mayor Bloomberg in New York did not uh, allow like, us to have sugary calories of soda. Yeah, there was, all, there was all sorts of rubbish in there, I'm telling you. So, yeah, maybe his policy was <laughs> only applicable to New York. So how did you get in the London finance scene? Like, w what was your progression there? My degree was in European studies with modern languages. So it's like a combination of politics and languages. So nothing to do with finance at all. They do a graduate program that I applied for after university. I'd been living in Spain for about a year and um, thought, why not? Let's give it a go. And um, they basically train you up, teach you everything. And then you have a very quick route through where you start in, in analytics and you move into sales. Yeah, you you're probably good there. at that. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> You're kind of doing that now. And actually, we don't necessarily always think about what we're doing and how it's going to help us in the future, but it sounds like you are mixing that. Where did you study at university? Yeah, so I went to Royal Holloway, University of London. So it's part of the University of London. Beautiful building. I don't know if you've seen the series You about the guy who's, well, he's a serial killer and like a general crazy yeah, bastard. Pen, Pen Badgley. Uh, Pen Badgley, that's right. Who's Great actor, by the way. If you watch season four of You or Basic Instinct 2, that was also filmed partly at my old campus. And then you moved to Madrid. I was in Madrid for a year, like a year as part of my degree. And also in Brussels, I was working uh, in the European Parliament for a Spanish MEP for a while. And then came back to work and then came back to London. And that's when I started at, at Bloomberg in January t 2007. I left in June 2009 and then I went to work in media sales. So I went to work for a, a film production company that were making content for big brands like at the time companies like Ikea, and they had a partnership with, I think at the time it was The Telegraph, it's like a big, big newspaper in the UK. And it was like really innovative because at that time, YouTube was still in its infancy. Corporate videos were still really shit. I mean, a lot of them still are, but we were doing it in a way that was way more sophisticated. We had a sales team of four of us at this little office, and we were making about two million pounds a year. So yeah, we would have identify what we thought would be a good story convince them to buy it we'd then make the film about them and so it would go on the telegraph website and then there would be adverts in the paper to promote it as well and then they could use it on their website obviously put it on youtube so we were one of the first companies to develop like distribution deals where you would use media partners to effectively distribute so for example with ikea i remember the angle was sustainability so it was the idea of showing that ikea is a really sustainable company and that's why they they decided to do it because it fit their brand and their purpose and what they wanted to communicate Ironically, I think I learned more about sales working for that company than I had at Bloomberg. Because at Bloomberg, it was easy. Everyone knows Bloomberg. The credibility is all there. The business was all there. But then having to convince senior C-suite level marketing people to buy from this production company no one had ever heard of. At that time, Google search wasn't something that marketing people still had a lot of knowledge about. But one of the things that they did understand was that if you have a video, you are 54 times more likely to appear on the first page of a Google search result by using video than text, optimizing text on a web page. And they would see the results there very quickly. Yeah, and it was so much easier to just tweak a few things and see the results instantaneously. Now it's a little more sophisticated. Now it's more sophisticated. The stats I was giving people in terms of the billions of hours that were being uploaded onto YouTube in 2010 every year now like 2023 it's like a, in a day what was being uploaded in a year so it's like incredible how much it's yeah i've seen great. those stats too and also one thing i noticed is when i was first creating conceptual video audio mixes for vix tape what i discovered was there was so much content in the creative commons and the public domain that's just free it's out there depending on their licenses sometimes you could remix yeah. sometimes you could monetize sometimes you have to give credit but even then there was just an explosion of content because these services made it easier to upload content but so many of these good videos are just not being used they're not being seen they're hidden no, they're absolutely not, they're not absolutely. promoted there's not an ad budget for it and so as a society as a planet we're creating so many interesting pieces of content that will never get seen absolutely. and so sometimes i would find these motion graphic videos or people doing choreographed dances in India and they put it in the Creative Commons and you see it has seven likes and I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah. And, and I think part of the reason is because people aren't watching a full video that's five minutes long. We're, we're hitting next. We're skipping around. Yeah. And so part of 
what I had been working on is taking pieces of content, putting them together in these compilations. Everything is a preview of something else. The ads look like the content, the content looks like the ads, but it's transparent and you're able to learn more about what you see. And I think that that's how we're seeing the future going in terms of discovery. We, we are getting more into short form content, but also mm -hmm. there is this element of curation. Is, is it human curation? Is it AI curation? Sometimes I show some videos that are so weird and arty and trippy and people say, what is that? What the hell is that? <laughs> and, and I say, you know what? Scan that QR code, go on your phone, go find that original video and you'll read commentary and you know everything becomes so layered. Yeah, yeah. Even I remember that when you would do research for an essay, you would go to the library, you'd be reading a book and then you'd see two or three books next to it that would be also really interesting that you wouldn't have found. And so you would get that book. Whereas these days with the way algorithms work with search, or what's being suggested to you as content, if it's YouTube, if it's TikTok or whatever, it's the algorithm thinking that's what you want based on what you've already seen. But you're not necessarily getting the same experience that you would by going to say a library. The algorithms and the technology that connects us to content, even when we actively search or when we passively are shown things, uh, it's all changing now. Mm -hmm. And there is someone programming it behind the scenes, teams of people, and we have to think about, on an individual level, how do we participate in that with our actions and our stated preferences? And you can't just say no, because it, you're going to get lost in content. You can't just go to internet and just no. walk around the Hall of Records. and It's not no. like that anymore. No, I know, I know. And now we have YouTube Shorts, we have Reels, we have TikTok, <laughs> and there's these short clips of discovery. And the navigation is you're just swiping up and it's deciding for you, which yeah. I, I have a problem with that. Yeah. And yeah. So let's talk about the Renaissance. So Renaissance, typically associated with Italy, generally the time period between mid-1300s to 1600s, give or take. When you were in high school yeah. and you learned about the Renaissance period and yeah. you had this British focus, yeah. what did they tell you about? Well, we would never use the word Renaissance. It was only, obviously, Renaissance is the French word that means rebirth, right? We were only ever taught the Renaissance from the Italian perspective. So I do remember we had a whole year in history, very much an Italian visual way of looking at it. Interestingly, at my school, we didn't do a lot of history on our own country. We did when we were younger, so we do obviously, you know, the history of the monarchy and, you know, all the different kings and queens from, you know, 10th, 11th century right up until now. So we would do that. But I think the main one, and this was in English literature, would, would be Shakespeare, right? That was the huge one. My father was a really passionate Shakespeare lover. He was also into theatre. So I'll never forget when I was about six or seven, he would take me to see Shakespeare, but he would take me to see versions of plays that were retweaked to be more engaging for a young audience. So I remember I, he took me to see Midsummer Night's Dream, Twelfth Night, which were a lot more easy for a young child to be able to sit through. So it's not like the Leonardo DiCaprio, Claire Danes version, but it's no. something in between. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's still a play. You're still watching it as a play and they're using the, the, the language, so they haven't modernized anything. It's just a a shorter version of the play. But what I find really interesting about the Renaissance in, the, in England, and there's a, I think there's a very simple way of understanding why it was a literature Renaissance and not a visual Renaissance like it was in Italy, and that is because around the turn of the 15th century, the Bible was translated into English for the first time. In literature, the Bible is the most influential piece of text on any literature that's ever existed. At least Everything in the Western world, it. but I guess it was the book, the Bible. The book, right? The book. Until it was translated into English, no one could read it. You'd go to church and your priest would preach to you, right? And interpret the Bible how they saw fit. So there was this demand for the everyday man and woman to, that could actually read it and understand it and interpret it their way. It then spawned this renaissance of content and of being relatable. And also, I think, an interesting time period in... Uh, did, would you call it the UK back then or England? No, it'd be England. It'd be England, yeah. The, that, that, came, that came a little bit later. I was kind of surprised when I saw that Shakespeare was considered a Renaissance playwright, a Renaissance mm. artist, because it was happening at the same time. It, Italy, it was about 100 years after the, okay. the Renaissance in, in England compared to Italy. Yeah, it was, it, it was after. The impact of Shakespeare is massive because so many words and sayings that we use in English today were invented by Shakespeare. English was a language, just a mixture. It still is a mixture of a lot of things. French, German, Latin. And it wasn't really this all-pervasive language. I have a theory. I think during the Renaissance, everyone was kind of speaking a muddled version of whatever they grew up around to each other, and they could speak very easily to those people around them. 
But when you start going on a boat and you go somewhere else and you speak to people, yeah. everyone's just kind of like speaking in between. It's kind of like when I go to a country that if I were in like Romania and I can kind of get by with enough romance language yeah. knowledge, but we're just kind of not hitting the point. No. We don't have Google Translate in our pockets. No. I think language in general is a gradient, right? We have yeah. Latin that turns to vulgar Latin, which is Italian. And then you kind of go across and you have French, which mixed with Gaul, Germanic tribes. Yeah. And you have Spanish, which is a little more like Italian, vulgar, yeah. mixing with a little bit of North African, like Arabic. And then you have Portugal and the accent just gets weird. And so mm. it's a game of telephone. You're talking to your friends. You're saying a little catchphrase a little differently. And it evolves and it evolves and you just have different words for things. English had that, but they had it from the Netherlands and they had it from Germany and they had it from, I don't know, the Norse invaders, right? Mm -hmm. But almost like Dante's Inferno being Renaissance Italian, being this moment of this is what we're going to call vulgar Latin Italian. This is our language, at least in that in the Florentine city state. Yes. Shakespeare was that moment. And for the English language, he was the one to say, this is what our language is. This is what this language can be. Mm. So, for example, words like football, he invented that. Or s sentences like, um, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, there's hundreds of them. If you go online, you'll see a lot of expressions that you'll use in everyday language are invented, were invented by Shakespeare. Guess what? We have the internet. Fantastic. And I'm just going to pull out my phone. Yeah. Actually, can, can you read these? Because sure. your accent's better than mine. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me see. So this is the segment we call words that Shakespeare invented as a Renaissance linguistic yeah, I think, artist. For example, from the Taming of the Shrew, Break the Ice. Break the ice, yeah. icebreaker. Break icebreaker. And in Spanish, it's like rompe cabeza, right? Uh, we say, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Come what may, come what may, that's from Macbeth, so whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Also a Moulin Rouge. Um, the devil incarnate, eating me out of house and home. Eating me out of house and home? Yeah. Okay, that, that's British. That's, yeah. We're not saying that in uh, Jersey. Pound of flesh, the merchant of Venice. The lady doth protest too much, that's from Hamlet. Too much of a good thing, as you like it. To wear one's heart on one's sleeve, that's from Othello. What is done is done is from Macbeth. So a lot What's of these done phrases, is done. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, let, me, let me see if I can pick out some. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe to an American audience. Fair play, uh, making someone a laughing stock. Yeah. In a pickle. Yeah. It's Greek to me. Yeah. Too much of a good thing. How was too much of a good thing not a concept before he said it? I know. Wild goose chase. Yeah. Uncomfortable. All that glitters is not gold. There you go. Uh, that's, a brilliant one. that's a brilliant one all the glitters is not gold. jealousy yeah. is the green-eyed monster there you go cold-blooded when you're going to high school in america shakespeare that's that's the big leagues that's like the serious thing yeah right. and you know it can be intimidating and that's i think the beauty of of shakespeare is that sometimes and it happens to us as well in in, in england is that um it, it can be intimidating and there are some plays that are really heavy going right um, but then there are some plays that are much easier to, to read when it's your first time learning Shakespeare, and, and Shakespeare doesn't have to be intimidating. It can be, it can be amazing. It can be, it can be really enriching. Well, I think one thing that's interesting too is what we actually end up reading in a lot of schools is the abridged version of mm. content, probably a 800-page version of some of these pieces. And plays are always being remixed, workshopped, characters swapped out. There's always an understudy coming in, like they're living dynamic things. But what we're reading for the purposes of academic study are actually yeah. cut down curated pieces, just like the algorithms we were talking about. Yeah. So we have this person that has all this time in the world writing prolific things. We're living in a time now where we have too much that's too interesting uh, to the point that you, know, you got to keep an iPad away from kids because it's, it's too shiny. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if I can just say briefly, the Renaissance in, in England, literature renaissance, it's not just a literature renaissance, it's a theatre renaissance as well, because Shakespeare's plays wouldn't have had the success they'd had unless there were good actors to perform them, right? And you've got to remember that back in the day, the old Shakespeare Theatre Company would maybe be made up of 12 actors. and all they men. could perform All men. And they could perform every play, every single play. So they'd go to see the king or the queen and they'd be like, oh, perform Twelfth Night. And they just perform it. Well, I incredible. actually heard there was a memorization technique that bards, if you're a bard, you know, you're the guy with the lute who sings a song, yeah. you're kind of a performer. Yeah. If they have to tell a long story like the Iliad or some sort of prose, they visualize a house and every object in it and they put a word in it. So as they're talking to you, they're walking around their house or this building they created in their mind and able to recite so much more than the human brain should be able to say, mm. especially at that time. And I think it's interesting that Google's AI service is called Bard. There you go. See, you know, that's very interesting. A little bit of entertainment, a lot of knowledge, and it is about the bringing of that content to you, to what's yeah. relevant. And I just think in general, it's so important to look at history because it explains so much of what exists today and why. And that's why I think it's great to revisit these periods. And I know we, we were sort of half joking saying, you know, we in another Renaissance now, is this another, you know, 
time where things have, you know, and what would that be today? Well, let me ask you, do you think we're in a renaissance right now? And if so, what is the renaissance now? Well, first of all, I really like the way you say renaissance. Okay. <laughs> Second of all, um, renaissance, you said, meaning rebirth. And yeah. I, I think society is always constantly changing itself and evolving. Sometimes it's moving forward, sometimes it's moving back. And I think that progress is inevitable or change is inevitable or evolution is inevitable. Uh, our bodies are going to adjust somehow, even if we have you know, cell phones around us or we're, we're plugging in technology into ourselves. But yeah, I think the difference that I notice is that during the dark ages, the control of information and content was done by just a few people. Mm. And I think we've even seen this in the 90s uh, where we had the commercialization of the internet and all of a sudden everything was available. But then there's kind of periods where it goes down and up. And what the Renaissance was 300 years of of evolution and change and we're seeing it happen right now in decade by decade and so I'm noticing we're having the internet we're having mobile phone applications and I do think we're in a renaissance right now I think that we're in this moment where uh, not that we've been in the dark ages but in terms of human consciousness and potential we've spent a lot of time on this planet just trying to get basic things done from our mm. day to day and then we have a little bit of flavoring, like icing on the cake of, oh, and then we can create art and music and things like that. It's kind of what separates us from bugs or animals that, that don't have this uh, level of civilization. But as we evolve, we kind of have this moment where we can choose to evolve a certain way, but also we're creating technology that can choose to evolve itself a certain way. Hmm. I think that's where some of the fear and concern comes from, that we are making technology that can create itself. Yes, I mean, that's terrifying. It's just terrifying. And also, I'm, I'm curious to know what is going to actually be a fad and what's actually going to be something that, that takes over, right? I was always on the fence about 3D content, right? And I have this theory that I'm curious to see if that happens to the metaverse or not, if this actually becomes something more mainstream or if it's just another fad like 3D content and it fucking disappears. Yeah, so I, I think about programmatic inserts of content and ads in the metaverse sometimes. I think that right now we're having an issue with the comfort of a headset on your face, you're getting sweaty. But I think that during times like COVID, we wanted to leave our world and go into these immersive spaces. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of events and uh, even business meetings have changed because of the metaverse for the positive. But people were expecting it to get somewhere and trying to push it to get there quicker than it necessarily was going to progress naturally. Mm. My thought is, the media that surrounds us is important. The audio, the video, the, the critical thinking or the intention of that person who made that piece around us influences us. When we look at the media that surrounds us now, we have so many different sources. We have these media bubbles and then we have algorithms that are forcing us to like things. And, there, and there's a lot of shit content now, <laughs> you know, because, because there's such a pressure to churn it out so quickly because people have a shorter attention span. They say that we're kind of past this period of the golden age of television because or peak TV, like peak oil, it's like peak TV. Yeah. This concept that we have so many streaming services, they're, they're competing with each other, there's these business models, they're dumping money, they're doing high production content, and we're not getting the 22 episode series that's in syndication like it was in broadcasters, where you know you're gonna have a certain amount of ads. The ads aren't there, you're paying a subscription, they're making $50 million an episode TV show, so they're only eight episodes. But it is a long movie. So I think we're playing with the media styles. Back in the day, be an advertiser to buy an ad in America in like, let's say the 70s, you could pretty much get 90% of American audiences by buying the three major networks in the yeah. United States. Yeah. If you paid enough money, you got the ads, the people were watching the television, then cable TV comes. Yeah. Whereas now, unless it's a Super Bowl, you're not getting the same access on TV advertising, right? Exactly. And now the advertising is more relevant. Well, there, there is this progression of um, newspaper and radio, online ads, mobile ads, engagement on social platforms. And there, there's been this long progression in the industry I used to work in with uh, interactive television where you're either paying a subscription or you're seeing ads or you're going on a YouTube channel and watching homemade amateur content. Yeah. So there's this mixture of this world and how do you find people? How do you get the right content? How do you curate what's around you? Back in the day, you'd, you'd know your TV guide. You'd watch the TV show you liked. If you missed it, maybe you saw it next year. Yeah. If you watched it in reruns, yeah. like it, it's all changing. And so I think... It, there is a comparison to be made to this printing press to uh, translating, let's say, these religious texts into English and yes. how that changed society. Right now, we can translate everything into what's relevant to us. Yes. And that could be good or that could be bad. I think generally having a sense of being able to filter, we're going to have to have the tools to be skeptical, to have critical thinking, to be more participative in the process. Uh, one thing I notice as being in Europe versus the United States 
you go on any website and you're going to have this pop up that says, are you consenting to all these cookies? And I'm like, uh, no, but then if it's too hard, I'll just say yes. Or sometimes I'm like, I reject every time now. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. Part of the difference in the U S and Europe is in the U S you can opt out of those cookies, but you have to go out of your way to tell them that you don't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, which is to target you as you go across websites, not necessarily bad, actually it could be relevant. It could serve you better ads. So in Europe, it's an opt out. It's not an opt in. It's, hey, we, we actually, because of GDPR rules, general data privacy regulation, because of those rules, they show you this and you have to say, I want these, I don't want these. And it really interrupts the experience. I notice it when I'm on a plane and I come back and I'm like, what is this? Yeah. Part of where I see this is moving is instead of us having to manually check or uncheck boxes, we should be able to have collectives or aggregates of people that are kind of in the same club that have all agreed to generally the same terms, to give away certain yes. data, not give away, yes. and let that do the speaking for us. So we kind of connect it. And in a Web3 way, you can connect it to a wallet or a DAO or a group, and that can get more complicated with how the data brokering is. But we really have to think about how much do people want to spend their time with this curation, yes. walking around the metaphorical library yes. Yes. to find this content versus having content come to them. Who's behind that? How is it being thought about? I think Europe considers this more than a lot of other regions in the world. Mm. They're kind of known as like the pesky nanny state where they're just like putting all these rules where companies have to do so much to uh, to adjust to it. It's supposed to benefit small businesses, but really big businesses are the only ones who have the money to actually adjust their policies. When we look at media and content and what's around us, how do we decide what is curated and how do we become more active in that process? Mm. I mean, it's the million dollar question, isn't it? So speaking about content that was distributed across the world, when I think about the Renaissance, I think what were some of the discoveries that happened and how was it curated? And the British Museum came up. They're collecting a lot of Renaissance content and all other time periods. Yeah. It's kind of a hodgepodge of everything. Yeah. I mean, you know, think about it logically, right? Why do museums exist? The primary reason I think they exist is to ensure that important historical artifacts or works of art that are so important and so important for people to have the privilege to be able to go and see them to prevent them from being owned privately by rich billionaires, basically. Like, that's the way I see it. Now, the problem with that is that you'll have arguments, well, who, who, who should host, uh, where, where should these things be? And should they be allowed to be in one place at the same time? Should they be allowed to move around a lot? And um, when can they and can't they? And is a country deserving to have certain things returned to them because of being stolen effectively. Well, I think that's also, a whole other argument, right? And to consider, there's there's so many pieces of art that are hard to maintain. And if you move it around, they could exactly. break or you exactly. could lose them or they could be stolen. So it's actually expensive to it hold is. and host a lot of these things. It is. Um, I've noticed in, in Europe, there's so many small towns that have beautiful pieces of art, let's say in like Spain or Italy. Yeah. Or, and they have to spend so much money and get enough people to see it to yeah. pay for that thing yeah. or they need to get government funding or yeah. eu level funding yeah. you have the uk great britain they colonize the entire planet colonialization comes up a lot in this podcast by the sure, way sure sure fair enough just for the record colonialization bad it was a period of globalism but it's also clearly a period of exploitation i guess we also have globalism and exploitation in modern times yes but it was kind of rampant at that point so you have people in britain going all over the world, taking things that they think are important of note and curating them, maybe where they would have been held in the same regard where they were if they just stayed there and were honored by the local people. There's also an argument that somebody taking that piece and moving it and putting it somewhere else in like the British Museum is a way to get it access to more people and to protect it. That's that's kind of the only argument they have, really. Yeah, and it's bullshit a lot of the time but it sounds it sounds good it sounds very good it's yeah we're, we're now justified in stealing from you because you know we're better at keeping it and you know visible for everyone and, and looking after it better than you thank you very much it's like well it's a sore subject it's a sore subject but what's interesting is you see examples of when a, an important piece of art returns home for the right reason so for example during um during the spanish civil war and then during franco's uh, dictatorship in spain uh, which is interesting because it's around the same time as Salazar in Portugal. There's a, there's a correlation there. Um, during um, Franco's dictatorship, a lot of art, well, because of censorship, a lot of things were banned. So one of Picasso's most famous paintings, which is called Guernica, and it basically depicts the bombing of the Luftwaffe of this Basque uh, town in the north of Spain called Guernica. And basically, Franco had authorized Hitler to bomb this town and to practice right so it was it was barbaric it was horrific and there was also an agenda there because 
Spain had the civil war, they had unification issues. They and had they're fascists as well, right? So there's a, there's a political alignment there. They're fascists, but they also have these autonomous regions that are fighting back because culturally they've grown up differently. And exactly. Somebody exactly. drew a line and said, no, you're part of this country and said, well, I don't think I am. And then violence. It, 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 yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. And, and so this painting called Guernica, which is now in the Reina Sofia, really where it should be, this beautiful, huge painting. But it was in New York during Franco's dictatorship because he didn't want it to be seen in Spain, obviously, because it's, you know, a brutal depiction of what really happened and then Picasso. after Franco yeah after Franco died the painting came back to to Spain so um, that was really important that it came back because um, you can't erase history or you shouldn't be able to erase history I was actually thinking about this we didn't talk about this before but uh, Guernica is actually one of the most impactful pieces of art I've ever seen in a museum it's unbelievable isn't I it? was studying abroad in Valencia Spain in 2003 we went to Madrid and I I actually the size of it as well isn't it that's when you realize how big it is gigantic yeah. yeah and powerful and i remember i bought a t-shirt that had guernica which is kind of a weird t-shirt to wear like why would i wear a guernica no t-shirt? no no but um but 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 mike's had a had a print of it and it was framed in our in our in our old apartment because you know it's such a you know it's one of those images where unless you look closely you don't actually see how graphic it is so something from a distance you see it it's like okay yeah that's like a really interesting image but then when you look in there and you see just how violent it is it's unbelievable yeah and you and you see little hints of a face and the more you read about it and you read about the historical context yeah. it, it becomes this multi-layered art form where yeah. you're seeing the context there's also the journey of what happened to the painting itself yeah and uh and how it makes you feel like if it's art it should make you feel something absolutely and i don't know if it was there when you were there but when i was last there a few years ago there is now uh, in front of the painting there is an exhibition of photographs which was one of the lovers that picasso had at the time she photographed him painting it and it's incredible because oh. you see the stages of him painting the, the painting. you know and the thing about picasso too is i always thought oh he's, he's such an abstract artist like why does he make things look ugly is he not good but you realize in his history it's actually a multidisciplinary and artist and yeah. he's good he could do renaissance style painting he could do anything he just liked cubanism effect but well, he, he created it like yeah, he, yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. The cubism yeah cubism yeah exactly cubanism not cubanism <laughs> <laughs> that's that's something else <laughs> <laughs> that's a different adventure this is something i've seen in europe happen quite a lot some some pieces of art will move around um and it can happen with um you know these pop-up exhibitions you'll see well, they go on right air flights and they hop around europe just like no all the no 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 <laughs> they have to be very careful how they do it but you know like um i don't know if you saw it in lisbon we recently had the well there was the banksy exhibition no i didn't get no to see that it. was brilliant and then there's a frida Kahlo one as well you know art shouldn't just stay in one place there should be an opportunity for more people to see it right um, but equally, I think uh, a museum needs to make money, and the best way to make money is to have exclusive art, which you can't see anywhere else. Therefore, you come to the museum, pay, and see it. And, and, that's and now you can make it an NFT or put it in the public domain. You can, you can, or as an artist. And I'm surprised someone like Banksy hasn't done this yet, which is to create something, have a unique NFT of that piece of art, and then destroy the original piece of art so that all that's left is the NFT. I've seen that. Yeah? Yeah, they put it in a shredder. It's, that's crazy. It's really visceral. It's, wow. It makes you feel something. But then there's kind of been this backlash of people saying, can you not destroy art? Mm. <laughs> like, can you not make it digital and more valuable? And that was also when NFTs were considered more valuable because that goes up and down. So speaking about art and how it makes you feel and people hopping around from place to place, you also are a DJ. Yeah, I do like to mix music. I used to sing in a choir when I was younger for about 10 years. So I've always been musical. I play the guitar. Are you soprano and alto bass? Well, as my voice broke, I went from being a soprano to an alto to a tenor and then a bass. The, the DJing was something that happened in the last 10, 12 years that's just really fun. Um, I'm going to teach you how to do it one of these days. We'll do a party somewhere and I'll show you how easy it is yeah Very so easy. i i'm not a dj but i can create a mood and a vibe with a playlist yeah and i also get into more video ambient stuff because i felt like that was this missing void that needed to happen and then i got involved with the technology underneath it uh, but i do have a lot of respect for djs and i've had collaborations where i would work with the dj and the djs playing things i feel like it's a big success when i can make like a dance mix or abstract art mix that really hits the beat. As humans, we, we take in a lot in terms of visuals, audio, and even, you know, you could smell flowers and be taken somewhere. But what we have more control over in this time period and with our technology is about how to create our soundscapes and our visual scapes. And when you're at a party, of course you need a good music playlist track. So tell us about the time periods of music that you're wow. connecting to the most. Yeah, so I mean, I would say my favorite era or style of music is disco. But I've also really like traditional house music, techno, drum and bass, garage, which was really popular in the UK in the 90s. I really like hip hop. 
I like R&B, soul, jazz. So I've got a hugely eclectic taste, but mixing, I really like mixing disco, techno, house. Yeah, uh, I love that time music. period where disco turned into house. I yes. guess maybe more like Chicago period. Yeah, Detroit, Chicago, like around that time. Yeah, yeah the and then it was the origins of techno. But also yeah. in Europe, Italo disco was kind of an offshoot of disco. Yes. A little more synthetic. And it was still going on into the 80s, whereas in yeah. America, people transitioned to other new yeah. wave formats in the UK, obviously, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, in a way, when you're a DJ, you are mixing music and you are creating a vibe and a feeling by taking content made from other people and you're combining it in new ways. But you're also curating it in real time for the people that are in a room. Yeah. So you're you're a living algorithm when you're a DJ. That's a very good point. I never thought about it that way. The most important thing of being a DJ is knowing how to play in terms of the mood of the crowd that you're playing to and sometimes being willing to completely rip up the next 10 or 20 tracks that you were thinking about playing and just go in a completely different direction and it's very meritocratic in that sense and people walk away thinking yeah that guy kept everyone dancing that's the main the main objective yeah and i think in a way you have to warm people up you kind of have to meet them where they are so it could be a progression to get there mm. they need to have you know their right chemical combination in their bodies drinks whatever yeah way before they go out there and, and really let loose. So it does take a bit of a warm up. Also, you know, people go out very late in Portugal and Iberia in general. Yeah, I mean, this nightclub isn't open till midnight, right? So it's from midnight to six in the morning, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah, my secret is go to sleep at nine, wake up at midnight, take a shower, go to the dance event, stay till whenever it ends, go home, sleep through half the day. And I don't, I can only do that a few times a year. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think yeah, like two or three times a year maximum. Sometimes when DJs play music, they're just in their own space with their head and they're like, this is what I'm going to play. I don't care what you want. Versus like, I don't, maybe like the wedding DJ cliche of, yeah. you give me 20 bucks, I'll play whatever song you want. How come some DJs play just like these beat driven electronic things, but not yeah. like a pop song in the middle of it? Got to remember something very simple is that when you're mixing house music, for example, then typically you're looking at BPM, which is the beats per minute, right? So you're looking at what BPM your tracks are and you want between 125 and 128 BPM. So that's why, for example, you will hear a DJ mixing an old 70s disco hit with like something more modern that's more housey because the BPM is similar and it can transition in or out. When you're DJing at a wedding and you're mixing all different types of music and you're not really mixing, you're just sort of fading in and out, you're doing that because you're catering for a wider audience because you'd have people who are 12 and 80. So it's trying to keep everyone dancing and be meritocratic about it. And your job is to have everyone having fun. I think I'm a wedding DJ. <laughs> <In terms of laughs> it's stuff. the hardest one to do, though. Can you imagine like DJing at a wedding and trying to get everyone dancing? And that's why funk is really good. Genres that work really Earth, well. Earth, Wind and Fire. Yeah, yeah. And cheesy stuff, too. And obviously big hits like Macarena, unfortunately, you know, things like that. I've um, been thinking about BPM a lot recently because well, Spotify and Apple, they do a playlist that are created based on that. Yeah. Uh, but I've been working in this AI product management class and you have to look at data inputs and outputs. Yeah. And there's things that are stated with any sort of file or media yes and there's things that are observed so bpm is kind of both you can you can observe the bpm pretty quickly with technology or you can have a track that's associated with that yeah and, and, and you can manipulate it as well the thing is you can't manipulate it too much because then it just sounds shit. a lot of cases right but you've got a four or five number leeway to make sure that you've got that consistency with mixing and that's why djs have headphones right so they can listen to what they're going to queue up next so sometimes you'll think what about this will this work here and you listen to it and you're like, oh no, shit, no, no, no. And, okay, fuck, I've got a minute now before this track ends. And that's why it can be stressful, right? And then all of a sudden you'll be like, what about this one? And then you're on the fly, never have thought you could combine both those tracks and you'll do it. And that's what a good DJ can do is like think on their feet and do that. And that's where it's really important to be flexible. Like I'll never have a playlist in my head. I'll think I've got 40, 50, 60 tracks that I might use, but I don't know when or where or how. But if I can't make a good set with 50, 60 tracks, then what the fuck am I doing, basically? You know? Yeah. Do you think AI could be a good DJ? Yes, I think AI can be a good DJ. And DJs, when they start out, you have a sync button that you can use to seamlessly mix one track to another. And Spotify does that as well. And you've got the radio algorithm on Spotify that will recommend tracks and even mix one track to another. So I think it can do it very, very well. The only thing that I don't know if the AI can do yet is react to a crowd. If there was a way for uh, an AI app to detect movement 
on a dance floor and when the movement is dropping, i.e. not as many people dancing, would know what to play next to get people back, that would be super interesting. Uh, there's things that AI might pick up on with body language or cues that we might not pick up on as people. Yes. But as humans who have evolved from primates to now, we do look at certain things like facial symmetry, just just a subtle twitch of the face in a certain way. And that those are things that AI is still learning. That's why you see sometimes when the outputs of generated images, people just look a little off. Their mouth is stretched a little bit where we're like, oh, we would never but do the, that. But, the, but this is a huge problem. And I think Malcolm Gladwell talked about this in his, in his last book, where it's like, if you watch an old show like Friends and you see that the way the characters are portrayed and the visual cues you get, like, you know when Ross is being crazy and pissed off, you know when Phoebe's being quirky, you know when Rachel's upset about something, but the real world isn't like that. We don't always give those same visual cues in the real world. So to try and figure out an AI to do that correctly, you don't want it to be stereotypically what humans are meant to portray themselves as. What will AI never be able to replace or struggle to replace in the short to long term? And I think part of the problem with access to content, whether it is music or literature or art, you still need help. You still need someone to guide you sometimes. So whether it is a DJ playing music for you that you, that you didn't know and that you de then like or going to a library and a librarian saying hey what about this book a bit like back in the day when you go to blockbusters and if the guy was good they'd be like yeah you i noticed you rented this movie out what about this one because i think you'd really like him because if you like tarantino you like this da, da, da. like an algorithm still can't do that in that way you know because it's very tailored um, yeah, and there's something, sense, there's something different too if you're in a, in a video store being recommended a video and someone's saying you should watch this versus exactly. you're going through your video on demand screen and it shows up as the next recommendation while you're alone in a room. So I yeah. think when we think about technology and will it take over everything, humans are always going to talk to humans and we're going to like recommendations or trust or shared experiences with other people. And I do think that you know, if you're a DJ and you use Spotify to recommend songs to help add content to your playlist as you manually mix it, we're going to move more in that hybrid situation. Just yeah. like how we talked about 3D spaces and are we going to put glasses on our head? I think it's actually going to be more like we're going to have this screen showing us something, this projection on this wall, a speaker here playing music, and they're all going to be communicating to each other. So yeah. it's a 3D experience, but it's actually around us. So that's more augmented yeah. reality than, than uh, virtual reality or actually mixed reality moments. Yeah. And maybe more importantly, Michael, don't be lazy because sometimes the best music or art or literature isn't going to be easy to find. And like what you were saying, you'd see a TikTok of some guy dancing and it's got seven likes thinking, oh, but this is amazing. But that's because you're a curious person. It's the same thing with music. Some of the best music out there isn't on Spotify, isn't on iTunes. You know, you have to go to a record shop and buy it just like with a book. You know, you're not going to find it online. You're going to have to go to your library. So maybe the, the way to look at it is, yes, AI and technology can help us but we still need to have that curiosity and want to find stuff that isn't readily available because that's where you're going to find the real gold. Yeah, so, so there is the help with, with using digital technology, with using algorithms and recommendations and technology companies serving content to us, but we still need to be curious and explore the world and put ourselves in situations, increase our network of people, and uh, just learn as we go to different places and different modes in our life exactly. and see what, what reflects that on a media level. Exactly, exactly. And the best way to describe it is instead of relying on an algorithm to translate something for you, learn the language yourself. Wow, learn the language of curation yourself. Yeah. Okay, well on that note, I don't think we can end in a better way than that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael, for My coming My pleasure, here. mate. Thank you for inviting um, me. I'm sure I'll see you soon around town. Definitely. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to post next time you have your, your big DJ set. Mate, oh, we need to we need to organize something. We need to organize something, definitely. I know, we should have some re media renaissance parties. Just yes, let's do that, definitely. Let's definitely. It could be like a really bad renaissance fair yeah. with techno music. Exactly. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. Cheers, mate.